Last time I showed you guys how to make a matrix, and you might be wondering, well, how can we get more extreme than that? Well, machine learning is a very long and complicated task, and the next object that we're going to learn about is even more amazing. The objects we're learning about today are called tensors. And tensors describe a relationship between variables and a vector space. Everything that we've learned so far has been leading up to this moment. Basically, vectors, matrices, they're all types of tensors. They're called rank 1 and rank 2 tensors. But we even have rank 0 tensors. So what's a rank 0 tensor? Well, the relationship between a variable and a vector space at rank 0 is simply what's known as a scalar. So examples of scalars, 7. 0 0.001, negative 3.14. These are all scalars, which are also known as rank zero tensors. We have rank one tensors. With vectors, we can represent things like area or even a point in vector space. Matrices are rank two tensors, and as we can see, it can represent multiple vectors and we can always find any particular value by looking at its position in the matrix. So we can see here, rather than just having one unit, we have two units which are a property of our data point. So to get to this value one, we would need to access value A, Y, which is in the second vector, X in the first column. So it would look a little something like that. A rank 3 tensor takes matrices and adds another dimension. If we take our matrix and then turn it into Z space, we can actually stack them like cards. If we visualize what are three matrices as almost a cube, then we add another dimension of space in which we can store our data. With our rank 3 tensor, we actually have three units which we have to consider to access any particular data point. That's because now our matrix extends into a Z direction, which would be this third value. If you're still having a hard time understanding it, you can kind of think of a rank 3 tensor as an array of matrices. 3D tensors are particularly useful because they provide a very natural way to represent data in a three-dimensional way. What's an example of that? So let's say we have a picture of a little puppy. Well, I've, I've accidentally drawn a monkey, but the point still stands is with an image, we have a height, a width, and there is actually a third dimension here, which is the value, the color value of each one of these pixels. So every pixel has an R, G, and a B, which comprises the color. So we can think of the RGB as the third dimension of our tensor. So every image is actually three images, one with all the red colors, one with all the green colors and one with all the blue colors. The colors are usually represented with a number from 0 to 255, meaning with 255 is completely red, green, or blue, and 0 is none. So if there's a 0 in this matrix, that would mean the image at a particular height and width has no red pixels in it. We can perform similar operations on tensors, but in the code today, we're not going to be doing that. We're just going to be converting a BMP, such as our picture of a monkey, into a data structure, which can then be used for inputs on predictive image recognition applications or other machine learning purposes. So let's get started with that.
Because tensors represent a relationship between a data point and a vector space, we can take the images that we represent as tensors and then plot them on a graph. So for example, pictures of dogs we could plot on a graph, and pictures of cats we could plot on a graph, and then draw a line between them in order to make predictions about what images more closely resemble what known object. Hopping into the code here, we have to include the matrix code from last time, that's a requirement and we declare our tensor object. So it takes a shape as well as the data. So the data actually contains the values, whereas the shape, if it's 50 by 50 by three, that's passed in as a vector parameter. Here we extract the size and then allocate the appropriate amount of memory. Depending on the size, if it's a rank zero, rank one, we're only worrying about rank three right now. We grab the size and set the data. We create a matrix of according to X, Y, and we create Z many of those matrices. Right there uh, is just the code for, it's a, it's a queue, so we're just looping through the queue. Every time you have a new Z, you have to loop through the queue. How we set the values in the tensor, you can use set tensor or set vector tensor. So here you can see it's just setting the matrix value. You pass in the exact X, Y, Z that you want. You can also do the same thing with get if you want to retrieve the value. It's just like getting values from the matrix, except we have this additional Z dimension. Z is also used uh, for printing, so printing and destroying. What's interesting about the destroy here is it also automatically destroys the shape vector that you pass in as a parameter. So for example, if you create these two vectors here and then declare your T1 tensor there, it will automatically deallocate that V1 for you, but it won't destroy any vectors you pass in the set tensor vector function. So at V2, you still have to remember to free. So just make sure that you're handling that memory right. The real benefit of this set tensor vector is that it allows you to set values across the Z dimension. So if we draw a little picture here, we can see in memory, a matrix is an array of vectors. And so if we want to access the vector elements at the same X, Y coordinate, it, but it's on a different matrix, you see we have to loop through the Z value every time and, and re-retrieve the vector. We can't just set or replace that vector. We have to iterate across the Z dimension. So that's what this set vector tensor does is that it, it will loop through that Z dimension. This last bit of code here is the file BMP. This was actually made by Terry Davis, but all it does is takes the standard bitmap. This is what a bitmap looks like in memory. It has an info header, and then it's followed by all the RGB values. So that Terry code, that file BMP, all that does is make sure that we collect the header information, and this code here is what actually gets the RGB value. So you can see we create a new tensor and if it's a 32-bit or 24-bit BMP, then we are able to, it has that structure that I just showed you earlier, so we are able to read it. We loop through the height and width, and every time we reach a new row, we iterate the pointer a whole row, and the last thing to just keep in mind here is that when we're retrieving those color values from memory, you have to do a post fix cast that means like that traditional prefix where you where you cast in the front that doesn't work you have to make your own function that's what a color value cast function does is it just retrieves from memory the colors and so that's how it works if you want to check out the main function you can run it in uh, Temple OS yourself it takes quite a long time so I can't show it off here but good luck is the best 64-bit operating system for your PC it's God's temple Ring zero only and single address mapped. Download Temple OS today at www.templeos.org.